Monica, um, my name is Ted Munoz. I'm from Dispatch. I've been there for 15 years. I've been part of the training staff for about half that time. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, we are going to talk about dispatch. The first thing I want to do is um, try and get you guys in the mindset of a dispatcher. So I'm going to play a little bit of a call. You know, uh, we've been, I've been giving classes on uh, stress relating to dispatchers and they're, and they're just starting to find studies and, and prove that the stress of a dispatcher sometimes is equal to the stress of people in the field. Um, this call I'm going to play. It sort of proves that. It was a call from 40s a few weeks ago in Pico Rivera, and this call came at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, it was a 16-year-old girl, you might have heard on the news. Uh, her boyfriend, I don't know if they were Skyping or if she let him in the house. Somehow he got in the house, and they had broken up two weeks prior. Um, so he gets in the house and he stabs her in the chest. She crawls up to her mom's bedroom, wakes her mom up, she calls dispatch. So it's a CHP transfer. You're going to hear on the call. CHP says, "Law enforcement. We're going to get law enforcement." Well, they didn't. Um, so there's delay in getting law enforcement there. Um, the mom is emotionally in shock. Obviously, she wakes up at three in the morning to this horrible thing. They think the assailant or the boyfriend is still in the house. So that's another problem. Uh, by the time medics or our units get with the patients, 25 minutes that the dispatchers on the call with this informant. So just a little bit of this call. thousand calls annually that's incoming outgoing incoming calls by themselves about half a million calls a year are coming into our center you guys know how busy we are um, out of dispatch we have we're averaging a thousand and forty responses a day um, that averages out to about 12 calls per dispatcher per call taker per hour sometimes in the days it's a lot busier they're getting up to 20 calls an hour at four o'clock in the morning it's sometimes a lot less um, oftentimes the rate your radio operator when it gets busy and calls are ringing over they're picking up 911 calls at the same time they're talking to you on the radio they're talking to an air squad so um, keep that in mind oftentimes they're, they're taking 911 calls at the same time they're talking to you they're only able to use their sense of hearing um, dispatchers have <coughs> if they're if we're hearing the NFPA standards 90 seconds to process a call and get it dispatched from the moment that call comes in so when the dispatcher enters it, then Tro 7 or Blue 8 hits it and it gets toned out the station. We're supposed to do all that within 90 seconds. 
Um, we have a all color interrogation, as you probably are aware of, but we're asking the same questions to every informant. What's your address, what city, what cross street? Uh, is it a house department business? What's the problem? Uh, gender, age, and are they awake? Are they breathing normally? From that, we have almost 150 call types, 33 medical call types. So this is important to, you guys probably already know this, but you know, this information that we're gathering in 90 seconds before we hit enter and you guys are getting the, the stuff on your MDC doesn't always match up to the reality of what's going on when you get on scene, right? And we're not perfect. We make mistakes at dispatch too. You know, sometimes we get the information messed up a little bit, but uh, doing ride-alongs in the past and talking to a lot of guys in the field, that's one thing they're always, I sense their frustration at the difference when they get on scene to, than what the dispatch or what they might think is happening based on the call type they made it and the information in the text. So lots of times it's, there's a saying that we're only good as our informants at dispatch, but the training staff believes we're only good as the questions we ask, but still sometimes the information is not gonna be accurate. Like the informant is never gonna say that they've used drugs. They're never gonna say that, um, usually, unless they're, you know, obviously there's a heroin overdose, but lots of times they're not gonna say that they're, over, they're, they're, they're abusing drugs and you guys get on scene and wonder why that wasn't related, it's because we didn't get that information. All right, so again, we can only use our sense of hearing, basically. So imagine performing a patient assessment, except you will be blindfolded, you can't see, you'll be handcuffed, you can't do anything physically, really. Sometimes you're unable to speak with the patient, you're unable to use your equipment, and you have less than 90 seconds to do it. That's what a dispatcher has to do, determine that call type to the best of their, best of their ability within 90 seconds. Um, I am proud to say our dispatchers are highly trained, probably the best in the country as far as the hours that they get initial training. They get nine hours initial classroom training, uh, I'm sorry, nine weeks initial classroom training. Um, 120 hours or three weeks of medical training. That's more than any other comp center I've heard of in this country. Um, they get, have to have 24 hours of CE every two years. Um, this kind of relates to your front page handout there. Oftentimes they're using multiple computer systems up to 12. It's highly stressful as you guys are aware of. Um, we want everyone, to, uh, all the guys in the field to come and do a sit along. We encourage that. Everyone that does a sit-along, the most common things we hear from our dispatchers from the field guys who do sit-alongs is they say, I never knew you guys did all that. And they also say, I can never do this job. So it's a different, totally different skill set than what you guys do. So now we're going to talk about tiered dispatch. Um, the first thing I want to say, a lot of these slides are taken from the actual training that the dispatchers got. So it's slightly tweaked, but a lot of it's the same. One of the issues we had with dispatch was we had a lot of uh, initial pushback. We've been, we're gonna learn that we've been training at dispatch, we've been anticipating and training for this since 2012. Um, and in those early days, we got a lot of pushback. People didn't, you know, we've always sent engine squad and ambulance on everything. Uh, and when we started telling them that we're gonna, might change the way we do it, we're not gonna send a squad on all calls. The immediate thing was, you know, we're going to be liable. They're going to blame dispatch. Stuff always rolls downhill. Somehow we're going to make a mistake and we're going to be blamed. Really, the thing to keep in mind, we've had Dr. Kazan come talk to our di um, dispatchers. We have Chief Marino and we've done a good job of kind of explaining things to them over the years. This is the direction the department wants to go. We've had dispatchers in the past that have been really reluctant to um, accept this. Um, people have strong feelings about it. I might agree with some of those feelings that they have, but regardless of our personal feelings, this is the direction that the department wants to go. So keep that in mind. All right, what is tiered dispatch? It's basically the dispatcher uh, can determine the level of response based on the information they're getting, right? In our world right now, it's just we have these two call types, sick and injury, where it could be a BLS response for the first time. Uh, ever for LA County Fire, we're sending medical responses without a squad, paramedic squad. A little bit of the history, it's been successfully used since 1978. It's used all over the, the world. Uh, I don't know of any big agency that doesn't use it. We'll get to that in a second again. Um, there's two different types, criteria-based and protocol-based. Criteria uses more or less triggers. So during the dispatch, if they hit a trigger, 
like age or head injury, whatever it is, automatically it's going to be an ALS response. Protocol is more of you're following questions along and the questions will guide you whether or not you're going to make it um, ALS or BLS. County's gonna use a hybrid, we're using a hybrid model that sort of combines both. So based on initially what the informant tells us, that's gonna determine what the dispatcher makes it. Then when they go to their EMD or pre-arrival instructions, that's also gonna be, there's gonna be safety nets, in, safety nets in there and if they hit a trigger, it's gonna upgrade that call to an ALS. These are just uh, the main uh, commercial uh, tier dispatch uh, programs that are used, APCO, NA, IAED or NAED, uh, ProQA, that's what LA City used to do, used to use. There's a couple other ones. So those are the main ones. All of our neighbors and pretty much every big city dispatch that I've ever heard of uses some type of tier. So the question is not who's using it. The question is, you know, who's not using it? And we're like seemingly the last big agency to not use some type of dis tier dispatch. All right, why are we doing this? Obviously, the bottom line is the bottom line, right? There is some more to that. You know, we want the big picture is we want to save our ALS resources for when they are really needed. The simple analogy is, you know, you're sending a squad on a stub toe when somebody's having a full arrest right around the corner, right? And also, we know we can't continue to operate in the way we've been operating. It's just not cost effective. So since 2009, to the last year, our, obviously all of our calls have gone up, especially our medical calls, from 245,000 in 09 to over 300,000 in 2015. At this rate, if we kept this same pace, by 2020, we'd be over 410,000 medical responses. So from 09 to 2015, we know those calls have gone up. How many paramedics, uh, ALS units have we increased in the county? One, one, and the engine 33 became a paramedic engine. So um, using our resources more effectively could be a key to, to help us through this. All right, this building down there, Chief Freeman building, the dispatch center was named after Chief Freeman, was built in 1991. And um, when they built it, and when they built our EMD system and our original CAT system, they built it in anticipation of a tiered dispatch. That's why we have so many call types, because eventually they knew we were going to have different types of tiered call types. That was in 1991. So here we are, 25 years later, barely starting to do this. Um, a little bit of the history real quick. Again, I mentioned since 2012 is when Chief Tripp came to us and wanted us to start looking at different ways we can possibly do a tiered dispatch system. Um, we've, had, we've had multiple trainings through the years for our dispatchers. Um, we were ready to go actually in the beginning of 2014, but it was put on an indefinite hold for a while. I think the union might have gotten involved at some point. Um, at least that was part of the rumors we heard. Um, but when Dr. Kazan came aboard, we, uh, we surfaced it, we brought it back to life. We did what was called a proof of concept study, which helped a lot. So that means uh, August of last year, we started at dispatch using these tiered call types. The field didn't change at all. You guys still got a squad and everything. But we were able to take the data of the calls we were sending out and see if it was matching up. So if we were sending it BLS, was it getting transported BLS or ALS? And from almost a year of that study, that's when we decided, or Dr. Kazans decided, we can try this and, and go live. Again, why did we choose sick and injury? Uh, those are, they're, sick is our number one call type. Injury kind of jockeys with TCs uh, between three and four through the years. But those two call types alone in 2015, um, this is monthly. Over 6,200 call type or responses for sick and injury. So Dr. Kazan felt we can make the biggest amount of impact with the least amount of change to dispatch by just testing sick and injury initially. All right, so um, in your handouts, you have EA, I think it's 333. So that's actually the second EA to come out on this, right? The first one probably didn't explain this as well as we would have liked. 
Um, but we feel this, this second, this new one here, 333, um, explains it a little better. And it's kind of, it, 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 it answers a lot of questions that guys initially had. Um, so we'll look at the definition of sick BLS first. And again, initially in that initial EA that went out, I forget the number it was, but um, it didn't explain this to you guys. It didn't explain the initial triggers, the initial definitions, and I think the new one does. So sick BLS, our dispatch definition is general illness, complaint of generalized non-specific pain, cold or flu-like symptoms, asymptomatic high or low blood pressure, earache or infection, toothache, food-related illness. You're gonna use this call type when uh, it doesn't match any other call type, basically. This is BLS. So for a sick ALS, your complaints are gonna be the same, but it's gonna have one of these triggers. Abnormal or, ace or abnormal blood pressure with any other symptoms. And it could be any symptom. It can be just feeling a little weak or a headache. It can be a minor symptom. Any symptom with a normal blood pressure, the dispatcher's gonna make it an ALS. Younger than seven or older than 64. Anytime you're younger than seven or older than 64, automatic ALS. Weak or dizzy, automatic ALS. So, and we get this explained to us in a million different ways. I'm feeling woozy, I feel like I'm going in and out, I feel like I'm gonna pass out. Any of those things, we're gonna make it ALS. Unable to sit, or stand, or walk on their own. Under the care of any medical facility, always gonna be ALS under the influence of alcohol, and third-party informants. So the informant doesn't have direct contact with the patient, we're gonna make it ALS. That means law enforcement calls, and we get a bunch of law enforcement calls, anytime they don't have direct contact with the patient, we're always gonna send a squad. Injury BLS, minor injury. I'm not gonna get a squad, so minor injuries. Bumps, bruises, scrapes. Closed fractures of the extremities below the elbow or the knee. ALS triggers. Again, we're going to have a lot of the same things. We're going to have the AIDS trigger, a weak or dizzy, medical facility, alcohol, third party informant. We're also going to have for injury A, this is like we used to have trauma. We don't have trauma anymore. So injury A or major injury is going to be a pelvic or femur fracture. So anytime the hip may be involved, we're concerned with the femoral artery. And, and keep in mind that dispatchers are not EMTs. Okay? They go through a lot of training initially. We teach them EMD, which is almost like EMT. They don't get hands-on skills. They don't have a very, they have a medical knowledge, but it's not very high. They're not EMTs. So for them, a hip injury, we train them that possible femoral artery issues, especially elderly patients, send a squad just in case. Um, what else? Crush injury, amputation, any amputation. It could be their pinky toe. We're going to send a squat. Uh, possible fracture at or above the knee or elbow. And right now, we're, even if they say a dislocated dislocation, we're going to send that as an ALS. We're going to consider that a fracture. Um, penetrating wound or blunt trauma to the trunk, head or neck. Trouble breathing or shortness of breath, altered level of consciousness. Severe uncontrollable bleeding, these are all going to trigger ALS, and then again, the AIDS trigger and everything else we talked about. Other triggers <coughs> that they're trained that aren't on their cards, but they're trained this in the classroom is anytime their oxygen saturation is below 94%. We're going to send that as a difficulty breathing. Now, when we first trained on, on years ago, when we first trained on tiered, we weren't doing medical facilities, so we would have to theoretically ask our convalescent homes, you know, what's their O2 sat and get that and that might play a difference in whether or not we send it ALS or BLS. Now, you know, medical facilities, convalescent homes automatically get a squad. Not that big of a deal, except if you got a, um, uh, a home health care person taking care of their elderly relative and they happen to say on the phone that their O2 sat is 92, they're automatically going to get a squad. Any relevant medical history that the dispatcher comes across, they say they're stage four cancer and you know some other some, some bad disease or something. If it, if, it, if it triggers that dispatcher, they're going to send it to ALS. Unfamiliar medical condition. Again, dispatchers don't have that high medical training, so if they get they get some condition they might not be familiar with, we go over a lot of training with them, but they still might get 
who knows. Um, most of the, you know, we covered some of the major stuff, but a lot of, it could be uh, high potassium or something like that, high or low potassium. If they're not sure what it is, they're gonna make it an ALS. Uh, and then their sixth sense, if they just get that gut feeling that they might need a squad, they're gonna send the squad. They're trained to err on the side of caution. Okay, again, in your handouts, you have an example of our pre-arrival instructions. There's only one, it's just sick B in there, so it gives you, you know, again, remember, when a dispatcher is going over their pre-arrival instructions, the call's already been entered. So now they're giving the instructions over the phone while you guys are in route. Um, and for the BLS call, it's gonna start with having these triggers, these bullet point triggers as a reminder for that dispatcher. If they're hitting any of these things, they should already know the patient's age. Um, but in case it got by them, the, the bullet point triggers are there for them to reference. And then they start going into their questions and you'll see if you follow through the, um, the algorithm there. If it says like chest pain or something, the patient either, out, do they have any chest pain yet? That's an automatic trigger and it's gonna upgrade the call. So what happens is the call taker gets the information, makes it a BLS, <coughs> hits enter, it goes to, to TRO8 or Blue 8, TRO7. Uh, they double check it, they hit enter, it goes to your station, it gets the ambulance, now it goes to the radio operator. Call taker still on the phone talking to the informant. If they have to upgrade it, they're gonna do a command that changes that call. It goes to the radio operator. The radio operator then has to do another command to balance that call. It goes back to blue eight. They have to double check the ALS unit they're sending again. They hit enter again, then it goes back to the radio operator. It's always touching different, different uh, positions at dispatch every time there's a change. So, the sick BLS is probably the longest and has the most questions of any, you know, unless you're doing CPR or childbirth, but um, it has the most questions, so that's why I included that one. And it's really not, doesn't take that long to get through the whole set of questions there. All right, a couple unusual situations. Engine 183 is an unusual situation because they're in, uh, paramedic assessment engine, or I think that's our official title of what they are, right? And they go on certain call types, certain medical call types without their squad, right? So um, this isn't a big deal for BLS right now because uh, if it's an, in you see injury or sick is in there, right? And if it's an A injury, they're gonna get their squad. And if it's an injury B or sick B, they're not gonna get their squad, so. Uh, it shouldn't affect us for now, but we're going to learn real shortly that some of the other call types are changing as well, and maybe this will change how we respond into 183. Okay, we have so many gray areas at, dis at dispatch, it would make your head spin. Um, nothing ever is going to be, you know, right when you think everything's cookie cut or something, you get a call where that's different. So if it doesn't fit into a box, we're trained that, you know, we err on the side of caution. Um, so we're always gonna, if we're not sure, send the squad. Okay, as we trained the dispatchers over the years, again, we had a lot of concern, some pushback. When we went back and asked them, what are you really, deep down, what is your big, big concern here? Their big issue was, I'm worried, I'm gonna pick the wrong call type, and someone's gonna die as a result of me picking the wrong call type, because I didn't send the squad. So Dr. Kazan has done a good job of talking to us and coming in and training the dispatchers as well and telling us, look, if that happens and somebody happens to be in full arrest and we send her to BLS, what really saves a patient's life is what? Quality CPR and AED, right? And the quality CPR started by bystanders. And then, and, you know, and so his point is, CPR and AED is a BLS skill, um, theoretically. We're six minute response time average, so um, this shouldn't be an issue. We don't have a crystal ball. We, I just heard of a call that came last week that might have been, a, went out as BLS. I think the engine might, I don't have specifics, I think the engine might have canceled the squad in route and they shipped them off BLS in the ambulance. When they got to the hospital, the patient was agonal breathing and ended up dying. Um, and it sounds like from everything I've seen, the patient just went into full arrest when they were being transported. Um, so this, you know, this is the first I've heard of this happening, but 
it might happen like that once in a very long while. So liability issues for our dispatchers, very concerned about this, right? And again, we just had to reiterate, look, you guys have liability issues. Every day you come into work, if, they, if you enter a wrong location at dispatch and someone dies, is that a liability? And that happens more often than I like to admit. Um, yeah, that could be a liability issue. If they don't give CPR or give improper CPR instructions to somebody that really needs it, could that be a liability issue? Um, yes. So what's common about these things is if they go out of scope of practice, those are liability issues. If you're following scope of practice, even with tiered dispatch, you are not gonna be held liable. Of course, that's easy for me to say, right? I'm just a trainer now. I don't even take calls as much as I used to. Um, but we've had tremendous support from EMS, from Dr. Kazam, from, Do from Chief Marino, from Chief Clark. Everyone involved is aware of what's going on and we encourage the dispatchers to ask questions from training staff captains all the way up to the chiefs and Dr. Kazan, even the union, because the, that was a big issue too. They're you know, changing working conditions was something we kind of heard. Um, talked to, the union was aware, we, we brought the union in, we brought, brought uh, Andy Doyle in and had him in our trainings um, and presented to the entire union staff at one point. So um, we encouraged them to talk, talk to anybody they want to about it. All right, again, don't forget the big picture. We keep reminding them of that. Um, this, is it a time critical emergency or a stub toe? Is it a minor injury or, a, or do they need a squat? Trying to save those ALS resources for when they're really needed. Again, Dr. Kazan uh, did a good job emphasizing that dispatchers don't have to over ALS, that the department's behind this tier dispatch program. And again, what really saves lives by center CPR, high quality CPR and AED. This came up, this comes up a lot, this question. What if it's the second, third in, fourth in squad? Uh, fourth in unit, not squad, but say it's a, B, it's a BLS response um, and you have the third or fourth in engine going, meanwhile you know you have a squad close by, right? The, that patient could be a couple blocks away from where that squad is and now they're supposed to sit sort of handcuffed like, a, you know, while letting a, letting a third in or fourth in engine come, this could be a, an issue, right? So our dispatchers are trained. If you know that there's a nearby squad and there's a significant delay, initially we were gonna put a trigger, a built-in trigger where if it's third in, automatically send the squad. But we held back on that. We're leaving it up to training and the dispatch experience and training. Um, so we tell them if there's a significant delay, we don't define that. But if there's a significant delay in which you know that the squad's closer, send the squad. Let your incoming captain know and let your supervisor know, but don't be afraid to send it if you feel there's a significant delay. For example, um, you have engine 74 going up into Santa Clarita on a BLS response. Meanwhile, you know there's squads up there that are closer. Send the squad. Keep that engine, captain going and let them know what's going on, let your supervisor know, but, but send the squad. You have Battalion 3 into West Hollywood. Same thing, if you know there's a squad, a paramedic available in West Hollywood, send the closer squad if there's a significant delay. Malibu, same thing, that can happen, especially if there's a brush fire there. You take a lot of BLS resource, a lot of engines, and then you have engines coming from the basin into Malibu, send the squad if you know there's a, a closer resource. So we're trained to use our situational, situational awareness and ask the supervisor if you're not sure. Here's our little quiz. What will we make this call, an ALS or BLS? A nine-year-old male with a bad earache and a fever. BLS, right, older than seven, right. So under the seven is ALS, older than seven. Earache, your infection, good. Six year old female, sprain her anchor on the side. Automatic age criteria is going to get a squat. Convalescent home, reporting a 59 year old male with high fever and body aches. Medical facility, automatic trigger. Six year old female, low blood pressure, no symptoms. A little tricky, but per Dr. Kazan, 
This is rare. Asymptomatic high blood pressure or low blood pressure could be a BLS response. Now, this is not likely to be asymptomatic. You know, usually they're going to say they're weak or dizzy or something, but if they happen to say there's nothing wrong with them at all, usually I, I can see it more in uh, low blood pressure. Um, you can send it BLS. <coughs> 10-year-old boy fell off the skateboard, scraped his arm, may have broken his wrist. Close fractures below the elbow could be a BLS. No H criteria, so that could be unless it's deformed, you know, multi compound fracture, bleeding or something, then it'd be an ALS. 57-year-old female who says she feels sick and weak all over. Weak is the key word. Anytime our informants say weak or dizzy or any implication of that, it's going to be ALS. Home health care worker reporting a six-year-old female with an O2 sat of 91. Anything below 94, it's going to be ALS. It should be difficulty breathing. Five-year-old female with a bad earache and a fever. Age criteria. Is home health care qualify as medical? No, silly. No. Seven-year-old female, low blood pressure, no symptoms. Seventy age criteria, ALS. Nine-year-old male playing soccer, accidentally hit in the face with an elbow and has a black eye. Well, no age criteria, so you're thinking maybe BLS, but our definitions say blunt force trauma to the head, neck, or trunk. Now, sometimes, again, sometimes there's gray areas. Sometimes the dispatcher is caught between, mm, I'm not sure. And based on what the informant's telling them, or the, it's just the, the tempo of the call or whatever, or, you know, that might come into play and the dispatcher might go one way or the other. There's going to be gray areas. So in gray areas, they're going to err on the side of caution when they're not sure they should in most cases. All right, so. EA 262, that was the original one, right? So that went out, uh, I think in June, uh, there was this little video training that went out on Blackboard or something also. We went live July 1st. And when we went live, we noticed that there could have been a possible misunderstanding with the field guys. Um, how do we know this? Well, there's your little meme, uh, misunderstandings and you know, miscommunication caused uh, divorces and wars and all kinds of stuff, right? And this could have affected what was going on here. So an overview of what, what we think the misunderstandings were, the field expected more type codes that were going to be affected. They expected every sick A and injury A to be an ALS transport. That wasn't happening. And they weren't aware of the dispatch triggers initially, right? So we were worried about sending you know, undersending when somebody was in full arrest. That was the worst case scenario, right? Somebody's in arrest, we didn't send a squad. What happened was almost the opposite. The field was like, I thought we were going tiered. Where's all the, where, why are we getting all these ALS calls that ended up being transported BLS? This isn't working, right? Well, keep in mind, one, we're just starting and we're starting very conservatively with this sick and injury. We're already going to talking about doing a phase two of this, including more call types eye injury, uh, medical alarms, um, what's that? CO alarms. Carbon monoxide alarms, not going to get a squad possibly anymore. Um, back injuries, unless it's, it's caused by non-traumatic back injuries. Um, bites and stings, unless they have uh, allergic reactions, or not, are going to go ALS. So there's going to be another level of call types that are going to be affected. All right, again, how do we know there was a misunderstanding? The day we went live, you guys have, everyone's probably looked, peeked at their last page. That's a, a list of some of the MDC messages we were getting initially, right? So the day we went live on July 1st, 840, we went live at 8 o'clock in the morning, 845. The first message we got regarding this was a message back saying that was an ALS. Right? Because they went on whatever, it hit a trigger that our dispatcher entered ALS, but yet they got on scene and it was clearly not an ALS. It doesn't mean it wasn't working like it's supposed to. Again, the field just, and it's not the field's fault because again, the initial EA probably could have explained it a little better. Um, so, 
we look at the call. This was the call. It's hard to see. It's his female 57, weak and nausea. It says that in the text, weak. So that's why the dispatcher made it. Again, the field wasn't aware of these triggers, though, so I can see this miscommunication uh, thing. Same day, still that first day. So every tiered call has been dispatched wrong so far. That was an NBC message we got, right? And these are the calls that that unit went on that day. Um, I want to say uh, the, the stroke and the seizure were the only ones ALS transported, right? But he's got an injury A there and a sick A, but he's saying every call has been dispatched wrong. So we'll look at just the, the injury A. Um, it says male 90, sheriff on scene, foul with lacerations to the face. Age trigger, injury to the face, that's going to be an ALS response. Uh, sick A, female 22, outpatient care at medical facility with the high pulse. Medical facility is going to get a swab. A couple days later, or a week into it, this was a G2 bleed, ankle injury, or barely even a BLS was the message our dispatcher got. This was a female 20. Um, hit with a forklift, ankle injury. This was a dispatcher discretion type deal. Because of the nature of the injury, this was a hit with a forklift. Um, she sent the squad. All right, so then we also have these cognito forms, and there's, there were links to that on the original EA. Um, so if you have a question, this is the best way to send your questions with that cognito form. And we got every question, and it also guarantees that you get a response. Um, so this form said, patient fell one week ago, now his son wants to get him to the hospital, no new injury, patient cannot get around by himself due to tailbone pain. This call appeared to be a BLS run. Okay, this was actually a male 72 trip and fall. So again, it's this miscommunication of not understanding, and again, not the field's fault, that we had certain criteria that dispatch had to, you know, if they tripped one of those things, we're automatically gonna make it an ALS. This form on the 5th of July, patient vomiting only, no ALS intervention required, squad canceled prior to arrival. Okay, this was a third party informant because it came from a bus dispatch. So third party informant, we're always in a center squad, even though it was just somebody vomiting, you know, probably not, hit, probably didn't hit age criteria. This one, dispatch, uh, the text on the call said, female 87, we already know that's a trigger. Fell yesterday, possibly broke the hip, left leg swollen. Then they're quoting the EA, per EA 262, minor injuries to extremities are BLS, Per uh, policy 808, suspected isolated fracture of hip in section two, you know, uh, quoting the policy. Um, patient was transported to BLS after assessment. And again, the age criteria was the reason it was sent ALS. Again, this is not picking on the field guys for having this understanding at all, because dispatch occasionally makes mistakes. God knows that as well. Um, but it's just, get a better understanding. I do believe that the UEA cleared a lot of this up or should clear a lot of this up. Okay, this is a psych rescue from the Cognito form. 16 year old female at a psych facility. A psych facility, we're gonna consider a medical facility, so we know we're gonna send that. Her chief complaint is anxiety, patient not SOB, patient not having chest pain. Patient was only crying and stated she was scared and having a panic attack. Suggestions? Maybe ask location first, why is a psych location calling 911? If facility does not know, maybe send an engine and ambulance. Most calls at psych locations are usually BLS response, and these locations have staff with oxygen, calming drugs, seizure drugs, et cetera. Thank you. Um, okay, until Kazan changes our rules or something, we're gonna continue to send these medical facilities. Do you guys want that kind of feedback? Is it helpful? It, it, it does. Feedback? It, it does because there might be something that we can learn from it. And what it also does is, is either a nurse educator or Dr. Kazan, who was mostly it was Dr. Kazan who was replying directly to these to you guys and, and explaining it, and, you know, and so that helped a lot too. 
Hi, how are you? My name is Sheena. I'm calling from College Hospital Florida. I'm going to have an ambulance come immediately, please. We have an unstable um, adolescent on our unit, and we are medically unequipped to handle her medical needs at this time. She's extremely anxious. We have an unstable patient that we, we're unequipped to handle, un medically unequipped to handle it, and it's a medical facility. We're going to send a squad every time on that. All right, this is a lift assist only. Patient's wife said she told dispatch patient was fine. She just needs help getting him up. So why did we send a squad? Alcohol. Could have been alcohol. Or it could have been that what they're telling you guys on scene is not the same as what they told us over the, over the call. Los Angeles County Fire Department Operator 50. Hi. Um, we need some assistance. Um, my friend, they, he was at the hospital and they gave him quite a bit of medication and he fell and it's me and his wife were trying to get him up but he has a problem with his using his legs so we're having trouble. We need someone to come help us. Okay. Does, he need, does he need to go to the hospital or do you need to help him? Yeah. Him? He was in the hospital and for pain and they were giving him a lot of, and they gave him a lot of medication and so his, his legs are weak. He's kind of, you know, a little bit sorry. From the dispatcher's point of view, what are our concerns or what are our ALS triggers? Unable to walk on his own. Weak. Disoriented. Does he need to go to the hospital? Yes. He's been on all these meds, so doesn't match up. And I get it. I get it. You guys are hearing a different story when you're out and you're seeing a totally different story, right? But we're also getting information that we have to go by too. So doesn't always marry up. This is an example of what Dr. Kazan would be replying to initially before that second EA went out when people would have questions about about uh, tier dispatch and why, why was this sent BLS or ALS. Our goal at this point is to ensure that the calls, that the calls are tiered BLS are accurately predicted to either be transported BLS or be released at scene. This is the first step in many that will move us to our goal of tiering as many calls as is safe to BLS. The call takers have been trained to identify certain features to those call types which make the patients more likely to require ALS follow-up. This does not mean that all ALS call types can be expected to be transported ALS. Please be patient with our process because it, it has taken us 20 years to reach this point and we're only one week in. We welcome your feedback and are looking at additional training. Please be patient and respectful of the call takers and dispatchers as this is a big transition for them as well. and We're all on the same team. So again, brand new. Started in July, you know, it took us 20 years to get here. It's going to continue to grow. Um, one thing we didn't talk about was what, what are our threshold standards that we're trying to reach here? Initially, right now, we're looking at 5%, less than 5% 5, 5 or less fallout, which means what? Which means calls that we enter BLS should be less, less than 5% of the time should those calls be transported ALS. One of the things, again, we've gotten even some feedback from saying, hey, this is great, we're meeting this 5% threshold rate, but what about these, all these ALS calls that are not being transported ALS, right? That was some of the questions that you right. responded to. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, the answer to that right now is right now they're focusing on BLS that are not, you know, the fallouts of right. VLS so calls. Make sure the program is safe. Try and make sure that those calls do not need to be upgraded to ALS. As opposed to, it doesn't necessarily impact the patient if you have to downgrade to VLS, but upgrading to ALS could uh, compromise patients. I sort of agree with that argument. It needs to be looked at as well, but right now they're focusing on the BLS to ALS calls as opposed to ALS calls that don't go ALS. Um, but eventually, we'll get to that as well. Okay, future dispatch. Um, these are our call types that we're looking at incorporating a BLS response in some way. Eye, bite stings, medical alarms, carbon monoxide alarms, minor bleeds, even traffic collisions unless they state that you know, there's some kind of major injury involved. Right? These, very soon here, Shane said October 1st, possibly as soon as October 1st, oh, so. we're gonna incorporate. Some of these will be straight 
starting, you know, they won't get a squad. Some of them we might try and uh, like back abdominal pain. We might do another test run on these where you guys will continue to get a squad, but dispatch is going to start to label these A and B like we did with sick and injury. So we can look at those calls and see if it's working or not. Uh, unknown medical, site calls, and all these calls from EMS section, they're looking at these and they have a low ALS transport percentage already. So it's what Dr. Kazan calls the low hanging fruit. Um, and so this is coming, phase two is coming. Uh, other stuff that we're changing at dispatch. Um, and again, as this grows, we're gonna change our instructions. You know, we might change our triggers. Maybe that age criteria is too soft and we have to rein it in more. Maybe some of the other triggers will be changed. Um, we're gonna ask a travel question, sort of like Ebola, standardize a travel question. Have you traveled outside the country in the last 30 days? And if they have and they show any kind of flu-like symptoms, that information is gonna be relayed to you guys in route. It's, it's happening right now. It's an old Dr. Uh, Pratt rule that dispatches, if, if somebody has uh, respiratory distress with coughing or a fever, we're supposed to be relaying that to the units in route. How many people knew that? Um, not all dispatchers do it. Why? Because the ones that do do it, what, the field comes back and says, okay, what do you expect us to do with this? Right? Because the point is, we weren't on the same page a lot. That's what working with EMS and we've been learning through this tier dispatch has allowed us to kind of work better together. The stuff we do at dispatch, you guys don't understand. We don't understand some of the things that you guys do. So if we can get closer to the same page, uh, it'll help a lot. What else? Tourniquet instructions. We're giving tourniquet instructions uh, at, at, at dispatch now. Uh, this is going to be rare where this happens, but we have the ability and we're all trained to, to use these cat tourniquets and even improvise tourniquet instructions over the phone if we need to. Um, Inter-facility transport, the cat was up here talking about inter-facility transports. This is going to be a new call type. Inter IFT is going to be the call type. Um, for us at dispatch, as I understand it, more or less it's going to be, you know, DHS definition of IFT is going to be a medical facility to a medical facility. But for us, it's a little bit different. It's going to be more or less a, hosp a receiving hospital to another hospital or a hospital to another receiving. It's going to be hospital to hospital, not a dog and cat clinic to another, you know, medical clinic. Um, and then that can change. We're looking at adding additional questions for dispatch where if it doesn't hit certain things, we just send it to our CCBC, our Command and Control uh, Battalion Chief, and they're gonna get involved and make sure that they have the, a receiving physician or receiving doctor at the hospital they're transporting to and make sure all those things are in place. So that could change. Uh, other things that are changing, we just got a new phone system, we just got a new mapping system, and we know how much fire employees love change, right? So our dispatchers have to use these new computer systems. We just got text to one that text to 911 that we're testing right now and using. So for the first time, citizens can text calls to 911. That ties into next generation 911, right? So how long have we been able to text on the phone for you know 15 years, right? So the first time now we can actually text. Next generation 911 is supposed to include video and uh, you can send photos of the traffic accident. Eventually, you know, we'll get to the point where we can see informants FaceTiming dispatchers. Uh, again, really behind the curve in this. Why is that? Because every time we make a change like this, it has to be implemented at the state level. And the state has to have the infrastructure to ensure that all their comm centers are doing it the same way. That's why it takes so long to get text to 911, to get FaceTime, even though we can do it right now and FaceTime across the world, right? New CAD system's coming. So a lot of changes. Remember to use your cognito form. If you have any questions, it's the best way to get a response. It's not like, you know, again, you're not gonna be put on blast and made fun of or anything, or you use this example in, in one of these classes. We take, the, we take the unit name out of it when we use these as trainings. Uh, any questions? Where do you access that cognito form? Is it on the... It, on it was the on the original EA 262 and I believe it's on the desktop. It's up, okay. Is it on the, on the intranet? On the intranet? Okay. Yeah. EMS section. Yeah, and if you get there and you can't find it, let us know.
Yeah. Gentlemen, let's uh, go ahead and thank Mr. Munoz for dedicating his uh, day off today to come in and give you this <laughs> The reason is here is, and he highlighted this point several times, is it wasn't delivered real well initially as far as the criteria. And those messages were, were from our people. And obviously those were probably a lot of the ones that could be placed on the screen for this, for this class. The fact is, you're the 20 newest stewards of the county fire department's mess in. You're going to be sitting at the table when the complaints about dispatch, the complaint about the call types. Arm your guys with the knowledge of what's actually out there and stem, and you know, address that early. That will be a big step. And that's why and a lot of these things did not get out for you, for any of us. When this was cut off. So hopefully, like I said, around 40 a little bit. So thank you again. I appreciate you coming in today. Thank you.